Now, primary plasma cell leukemia is a rare and aggressive form of multiple myeloma. Its diagnosis has been traditionally defined by the presence of 20% or more circulating plasma cells on a peripheral blood smear by morphological assessment or by an absolute uh, plasma cell count greater than two times 10 to the nine per liter. Hi, my name is Wilson Gonsalves and I'm a hematologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'll be discussing the findings in our paper entitled Clinical Characteristics and Outcomes of Patients with Primary Plasma Cell Leukemia in the Era of Novel Agent Therapy. This is going to be published in an upcoming issue on March 2021 of the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Now, recently, the International Myeloma Working Group has recommended that the criteria required to define primary plasma cell leukemia be less restrictive by including any newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patient with 5% or more circulating plasma cells detected by morphology on a peripheral blood smear. Now, this recommendation was supported by previously published data from the Mayo Clinic and Spanish myeloma groups that both demonstrated that the outcomes of patients with 5 to 19% circulating plasma cells were similar to those with 20% or more circulating plasma cells. Given the rarity of this disease entity and the advent of several novel agents in the treatment armamentarium during the last two decades, we wanted to evaluate the disease course, clinical outcomes, and cytogenetic features of patients diagnosed with primary plasma cell leukemia at our institution while using the new proposed definition of 5% or more circulating plasma cells on peripheral blood smear. So in our study, we obtained a cohort of 68 patients with primary plasma cell leukemia who were diagnosed between 2000 to 2020. They had a median follow-up of roughly 46 months. More than two thirds of these patients had 20% or more circulating plasma cells on their peripheral blood smear. Roughly half of these patients had high risk cytogenetics by FISH, and this included patients who had translocations 414, 1416, 1420, or deletion 17P. As historically noted, the most common primary cytogenetic abnormality in this cohort was translocation 1114, which comprised nearly 50% of the patients. The overall response rate to first-line induction therapy in our cohort was over 90%. While the presence of high-risk cytogenetics at diagnosis did not affect the probability of achieving a complete response or better, utilization of any form of stem cell transplant, either a single or tandem auto stem cell transplant or an allogeneic stem cell transplant, as upfront consolidation was associated with twice the probability of achieving a complete response to first-line therapy. We outlined the duration of response to each subsequent line of therapy for each of these individual patients based on their cytogenetic risk at diagnosis, and it is depicted in figures 3A and 3B in this paper. Now, the median overall survival for this cohort was almost two years. However, if you look at the median overall survival for patients with standard risk cytogenetics, and those who experienced a complete response to first-line therapy, it was almost twice that of patients with high-risk cytogenetics and that of patients whose response was a very good partial response or less respectively. These uh, results are depicted in figures 2B and 2D of the manuscript. Only these two conditions were found to be prognostic in terms of overall survival in a multivariate analysis. Now, about 10% of this cohort has not yet relapsed after first-line therapy. And furthermore, about a fifth of these patients were alive for 48 months or longer since diagnosis, which is almost twice the median overall survival of this cohort. Only the absence of high-risk cytogenetics, experiencing at least a complete response or better to first-line therapy, and receiving any form of a stem cell transplant as consolidative therapy were predictors of such a long overall survival outcome. So overall, the study demonstrated that the survival of primary plasma cell leukemia patients can be quite heterogeneous, and this appears to be driven primarily by baseline cytogenetic risk and possibly by initial depth of hematological response experienced by these patients. These findings may have implications on evaluating the role of risk-adapted treatment approaches in the future. 
the preponderance of translocation 1114 observed in the study is important given that this serves as a useful biomarker predicting sensitivity to small molecule BCL2 inhibitors, and this hopefully will be investigated prospectively in clinical trials. Now, finally, with the emerging treatment landscape of immunotherapy, such as uh, the chimeric antigen receptor T cells or CAR T therapy, T cell engagers, and antibody drug conjugates, we hope to see superior depth and duration of hematological responses in patients with primary plasma cell leukemia. This will definitely set the stage to once again change the natural disease history experienced by these patients and hopefully continue to improve their survival outcomes. Thank you for viewing this video and I hope you will read the full published manuscript for further details and forward any questions to me by email correspondence. Thank you. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our homepage is www.mailclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.